What if in one moment you were to forget everything? And you don't know where you were or how you got there. How can you tell who you are? How do you know where to go? Like guideposts in time, our architectural heritage stands as pointers which show us where we came from. Surviving the elements and the depredations of men, there are structures that have endured. They represent an irreplaceable legacy. As with any people, we devised our own means to adapt to our environment, using whatever was available to provide for our needs. To make use of rainwater running off from the mountains, we built the rice terraces and the cordilleras of Luzon. Nowhere in the world are there terraces of such size and length. Today, they are in grave danger, as the people who have maintained them are moving down to the cities to seek new opportunities. Long before the first colonizers set foot on our islands, different tribes and communities from north to south built their homes in response to nature and their environment. Today, we classify these houses as vernacular architecture. Held together by square frames lashed to four posts, the house is basically a cube-shaped box, thus the name Bahai Nakubo. The whole structure is raised to protect against groundwater and intruders. Its steep thatch roof sheds rain quickly. The split bamboo or wood sidings and floors are porous enough to allow air to easily circulate throughout the dwelling. This type of construction is so successful and so cheap it is still being made today all over the country. With the Spanish colonizers in the 16th century came urbanization. As the colonial government spread to the rest of the country, they planned all new towns around an open square called the Plaza Mayor. This was bordered by the church and its convent, the municipio or local council building, and the residences of the principalia or town elders. The roads were laid out in a gridiron pattern around the Plaza Mayor and secondary parks were interspersed among the town blocks. While we can still see this pattern in many towns all across the country, today's helter-skelter development and urbanization have all but wiped out this heritage. But with so many thatch and wood houses concentrated in each town, fire was a real and grave danger. When a fire struck Manila in 1583, the colonizers decreed that all structures in the city be made of mortared stone or brick and baked clay tiles for roofs. This made for structures that were more durable and less flammable. They could also withstand the seasonal typhoons and organic decay, but stone could not withstand the earthquakes. So the colonial builders reconsidered the design and by the middle of the 17th century, Arquitectura Mestiza was born. It was the fusion of a stone or brick house with a Bahai Kubo. The lower level or saguan was of stone. The living quarters on the upper level of wood was supported by wooden posts. Known as the Bahay na Bato, it is an adaptation of the Bahay Kubo and preserves the Kubo's basic structure. This design lasted for the most part of the Spanish period, over 350 years. Although referred to as Spanish houses, these are found nowhere else but in the Philippines, with translucent capi shell windows, airy ventanillas, and voladas, verandas that run around the house, allowing the windows to be kept open for comfort despite the tropical sun and the monsoon rain. We cannot speak of Philippine architecture without bringing up the churches that, by UNESCO standards, have been recognized as World Heritage Sites. No longer belonging only to Ilocanos, nor Ilongos, nor even to Filipinos, they are now seen as mankind's heritage, the legacy that the Filipino has given to the world. Adapted from European architectural styles by the local builders, they resulted in temples with such unique and diverse decorative elements as can be found nowhere else. With the Americans came Daniel H. Burnham, a highly acclaimed American urban planner and architect commissioned to design a capital reflective of the new colonial government.
Burnham was enchanted with Manila, with its red tile roofs and overhanging upper stories, which he said must be preserved. His proposed improvements for Manila provided for the development of a street system for direct and easy access to all parts of the city. The location of building sites for various activities, parks and walkways for recreation in every quarter of the city, the development of waterways for transportation and summer resorts, also an ocean boulevard. He chose the sites for the post office, the Manila Hotel, the Philippine General Hospital, but it was William Edward Parsons who realized most of Burnham's plans. Believing that form should follow function, his works in concrete and steel represent for us the beginning of modern architecture. The Philippine General Hospital, constructed in 1910 using the pavilion scheme, became a model for American military hospitals in other tropical countries. It consisted of a cluster of neoclassical buildings. He designed many other notable buildings. Within the opening decades of the 20th century, from 1913 to 1941, we saw the emergence of our first architect. Tomas Bimapua holds the honor of being the first registered architect in the Philippines in 1911. His most notable works include the De La Salle University, Centro Escolar University, and the Philippine General Hospital's Nurses' Home. Antonio M. Toledo, as head architect of the Bureau of Public Works, was instrumental in preparing the building plans for government departments and provincial capitals, for the University of the Philippines, and other government institutions. But the most prolific among them was Juan Arellano. His first major work was the legislative building completed in 1926. One of Arellano's greatest works was the post office building. A well-known work is the Metropolitan Theatre. Inaugurated in 1931, it is the country's foremost expression of art deco from the French for decorative art, with its details of batik patterns and various fruit and plant forms. Many of his other works still stand today. With his brother Arcadio, he designed the Gota de Leche building. Fortunately, many of these monumental structures still exist and are our landmarks for the start of the 20th century. Landmark structures give us a sense of place. More importantly, they tell us who we are. As in all the great cities, they symbolize the aspirations of the people, reminding them of their own distinctive history and inspiring them to live up to its greatness. The 1920s introduced the period of modernism and the second generation Filipino architects who bore the influences of their European and American teachers. Art Deco was the fashionable style in the 1930s. We can see this reflected in the works of Andres Luna de San Pedro, son of the painter and national hero Juan Luna. There was Fernando Ocampo, who was also one of the founders of the University of Santo Tomas School of Fine Arts and Architecture in 1930. Pablo Antonio. Juan Napil, who designed more than 200 structures and later named National Artist for Architecture. San Pedro and Ocampo returned to the revivalist styles while Napil and Antonio were committed to modernism and architecture from the very start of their practice. 
Our neoclassic buildings compel us to look back at the past and our modern ones to walk to our future. The Second World War left most of Manila and the rest of the country in ruins. The destruction was followed by hasty reconstructions, but the growth that followed became the opportunity for the coming of age of Philippine contemporary architecture. The masters continued their work. And a new generation of architects stepped forward to design the landmarks for the present. Among them stands out Leandro Loxin, national artist for architecture, whose works have dominated the capital's landscape for this generation. What about the generations to come? Given the repeated destruction of the historic structures, will these generations, like ours, still be able to see our landmarks and make them their own guideposts to their future? How much more will be lost and will disappear? Our built heritage must be protected and cared for if we are to tell a story that is uniquely ours. Our children and theirs should not be deprived of their sense of place, nor their sense of belonging. As we look around us, can we recognize the heritage that must be valued for their beauty, their uniqueness and their significance to our development as a people? Will we allow them to vanish? Or will we relish their presence and enjoy ourselves in them, employing them for our use? Not musty museums of fading memories, but vibrant venues restructured for our current needs and rationalized for our present realities. Profiting both their caretakers for their efforts at preserving these monuments and their users who find in them richness of their experience. Heirlooms handed down the generations that remind us of the past we came from the affirmations of our achievements that stand in our present, the beacons to guide our course to our future.